Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. I hope all is well with you. I was going to talk about sin in my life and your life, how to deal with it currently. That's one of the things that when you preach the gospel and you talk about grace, you have a lot of accusations that come at you saying that you're a greasy gracer or easy believist, that you're an antinomian and you don't actually care about sin. The truth is, we do care about sin. We just care about dealing with it in the modality and the method that God has given us without robbing ourselves from the peace and the joy that the gospel brings. Now, people that use the term easy believest use the term to try to give you to have a negative impression that just believing in Christ is not enough, that you actually have to do something in terms of human willpower, human effort, that you have to do something in terms of your obedience to try to deal with sin in your life. Now, when the Apostle Paul was under the law, that through his own willpower, through his own obedience, was trying to stop sinning and do what is good, he just found that he did the very evil that he hated. So in Romans chapter 7, starting at verse 18, he says, For I know in me that is in my flesh no good thing dwells, for the willing to do good is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I cannot find, but the evil that I hate that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, waging war against the law of my mind, and bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin and death. So we see that Paul says the willing to do good is present with him, but how to perform that which is good he cannot find. That in and of himself, in his own willpower, in his own strength, in his own ability, he does not have the power and the ability to do what is good. He says how to perform that which is good I cannot find. In other words, he cannot find the modality or the means to do what is good by his own strength, his own willpower, his own obedience. But he goes on to say, but the very evil that I hate, that I practice, that the very evil that he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing. Now this is Paul the Apostle with law conceptualization. Because in the prior verses he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So he's describing a person with law conceptualization. And we know from the scripture that the Bible says that the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. That what gives sin its power is the law. So the law is spiritual, but we're carnal, sold under sin. And when you put us under it, it just produces the power of sin. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. That's why he's under it. He wants to do good, but when he goes to try to do the very good thing, towards the law, he ends up doing the very evil that he hates. It just produces the power of sin. So in Romans chapter 8, the next chapter, Paul gives us a window into the means and modality in dealing with sin in our lives without robbing us from the joy and the peace that the gospel initially brings. In Romans 8.13 it says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now we've already seen in the previous chapter that Paul, under the law, with his human effort and willpower and trying to be obedient, could not do the good that he would want to do. He could not put to death the deeds of the body through human willpower and effort. The good that I will to do, I cannot do, but the evil that I hate, that I practice. So part of the good news of the gospel is that when it comes to putting to death the deeds of the body, it's not by your human willpower and effort and strength because you'll just end up doing the very evil that you hate when you try to put your hands to the plow and human effort under the law. It will just produce the power of sin. You'll end up doing the very evil that you hate. So the means and the modality to put to death the deeds of the body is by the Spirit. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, we see in Zechariah it says, not by might, nor of power, but by his Spirit, saith the Lord. So when it comes to putting to death the deeds of the body, we see that it's not human willpower, 
When Paul put his human willpower into putting to death the deeds of the body, he could not do the good he wanted. He ends up doing the very evil that he hates. So if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. So if by the Spirit, not by your human willpower and human effort and trying to make a pact to do better. Not by might, not by power, but by his Spirit, saith the Lord. And we see this concept also in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 3 where it says that he would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith so now we have a window of how we're strengthened by his spirit in the inner man and that is through faith that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and through that faith we are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now when it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, it's not just talking about some generalized faith that Jesus Christ existed. It's talking about what faith means, that you're justified, that you have a non-guilty verdict in relation to your faith and what Christ has done. We see in the scripture that he was raised for our justification and we see that the scripture says we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So letting Christ dwell in your hearts through faith is understanding that you're not guilty before him, that you're guiltless, that you're justified, and it's independent from law, performance, and obedience. If a person is not taking on the justified, not guilty verdict by faith in Jesus Christ, then they're not letting Christ dwell in their hearts through faith, because you cannot have Christ dwell in your hearts through faith independent from the justified, not guilty verdict that we have in relation to his work. See, walking by the Spirit by which we're strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man is taking on the justified, not guilty verdict that we have by our faith in Jesus Christ that he would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. See, our faith is more than just believing Jesus Christ existed as a historical figure. We're believing that he accomplished something on the behalf of those who believe. We see in Colossians 1.22 it says, He reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body by his death, that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So letting Christ dwell in our hearts through faith is taking on that reality that we're holy without blemish and free from accusation because that's not independent from Christ and his work. Letting Christ dwell in your hearts through faith is taking on the reality that he has made us holy without blemish and free from accusation. And this is how the Spirit is ministered to you. This is how you're strengthened in the Spirit. This is how you walk in the Spirit. You see, the Scripture says, He who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the keeping of the law or by believing what you heard? So it's a rhetorical question that Paul asked twice in Galatians 3. He who supplies the Spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the keeping of the law or by believing what you heard? which the answer ends in the supply of the Spirit, the ministering of the Spirit is by believing what we heard, believing what we heard about Christ and what he accomplished in its totality. And we know that he has made us righteous, he has justified us, he has made us holy without blemish and free from accusation. So the ministering of the Spirit is through believing what we heard. He who supplies the Spirit, does he do it through the keeping of the law or by believing what you heard? So now we see this verse in Ephesians makes a lot of sense lined up with that, that he would grant you according to his riches and glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit and the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that when Christ is dwelling through your heart, through faith, you are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And there is a ministering and a supply of the spirit by believing what we heard. See, when we believe what we heard and we walk by faith in the Son of God, it won't be about us trying to live out some kind of Christian life. It'll be about Christ living through us. It won't be about us putting our hands to the plow through human effort and obedience and willpower. It'll be Christ living in and through us. That I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. 
So Paul says, it's no longer I who live. So it's not about his life. It's not about him trying to live out a certain way to try to perform under the law in his own human effort, willpower and obedience to be right with God. He looks to Jesus Christ by faith. He lives by faith in the Son of God who loved him and gave himself up for him. And by this, Christ lives in him. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So when he lives by faith in the Son of God, the life of Christ is living through him. That he would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So you can see why I would have a problem with these derogative terms like easy believest, because we are called to continually believe on the name of the Son of God, not just the first day of salvation, but every single day we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. That is how Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, by which we're strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. And so people are trying to get you not to continue to believe, but to go back to your willpower and obedience under the law. But the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And we believe it and live in it on an everyday, ongoing basis. In Ephesians 1 it says, And that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power within us. When it says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? The believing is not independent from believing that we're justified and we are the righteousness of God by our faith, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus upon all and unto all who believe and there is no difference, that by our faith we're collectively and equally made righteous. So when it's saying that we would know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, believe what? Believe that Jesus was a historical figure? No, believing that Jesus made us holy without blemish, free from accusation, that he made us the righteousness of God, that he justified us. See, when we continue to believe and understand the clarification of what Jesus Christ has accomplished and who we are on the basis of that, we are walking and living in the Spirit. Paul said, if you are in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is the ongoing reality of who we are by our faith in Jesus Christ, independent from willpower, human obedience to the law. See, Paul is saying that he wants us to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty power that works within us. The mighty power that works within us is his Spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. So it's by the spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, not by human willpower and effort. Now the religious fleshly mind doesn't like to hear this because they want to hear that they have to put their hands to the plow to some degree or some level. The flesh feels like it has to take some merit, some credit, some performance ability in what it can do to put to death the deeds of the body, to overcome sin, to keep the law, whatever. But the flesh doesn't have the ability to do any of those things. That's why Jesus crucified it. We've been crucified with him, and now we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us, accessing the power of the Spirit through Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, that he would grant you according to his riches and glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So through faith in Christ, who he accomplished and who we are on the basis of that, we are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So when it comes to putting to death the deeds of the body, it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. We're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man through Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith. Now the flesh always thinks there's some obedience, some work they have to do other than believing. Remember when some people were talking to Jesus and they said, what must we do to do the works of God? They said, what must we do to do the works of God in the plural? And Jesus said, this is the work of God to believe in the one that he sent. One singular thing, this is the work of God to believe in the one that he sent. They thought there should be a bunch of works that believing wouldn't probably be enough, surely 
believing is enough. We've got to do a bunch of works. Jesus said, this is the work of God to believe in the one that he sent. Of course, I have a sovereign grace perspective and how God wills and works that through us, an understanding of who he is. You are my witnesses, declare the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and understand and believe that I am he. There's a sovereign aspect to this, but God has given us a faith by which we then walk in on a daily basis. Once he's given it to us, it's ours and it's our gift and we now utilize it on a daily basis towards the Son of God by which Christ dwells in our hearts through faith and we're strengthened in our inner man by his spirit. So the work of God is to believe in the one that he sent. And again, Ephesians 1.19, and that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power within us. See, a lot of people will make fun of you and name call and slander you because you will then continue to live by faith in the Son of God. They will call you an easy believist because you're not then going to your flesh and your performance and your obedience. But there's admonishments that we are to continue by faith in the Son of God. As you received him, so walk in him, rooted, built up, firmly grounded in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. So we received him by faith. We are to continue to walk in him by faith. And again, the faith is understanding the justified, not guilty verdict that we're holy without blemish, free from accusation, the righteousness of God, independent from the law, human performance, and obedience. And see, a lot of people have a problem with the idea that you can just believe these things about who you are in Christ Jesus, independent from anything you do, and that would help you with your sin issues. We see in the scripture it says, as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. First, a man has to know who he is in Christ Jesus on the basis of his life and work before there's any effect and strengthening by his might in the inner man by his spirit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, According to his divine power, he has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. Notice again that it's according to his divine power. It's not according to our willpower, our strength, and our effort. Remember, the good that I will to do, that I cannot do, but the evil that I hate, that I practice. That when it comes to human willpower to try to do good, you might as well just forget about it. That it's according to his divine power. He has given us all things. It's not like we have to work for it under the law to obtain it. He has given us all things. He's already given it to us. We don't have to beg for it or plead for it. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. Notice that it's through the knowledge of him that we access these things. The divine power again. The knowledge of Christ. What he's accomplished. Who we are on the basis of that. What the Messiah came to do. And who people are on the basis of his life and work. See, there's divine power access through the knowledge of Christ, the real Christ, and what he accomplished, and who sinners are on the basis of faith in him, and that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So when it comes to putting to death the deeds of the body and our sinful issues, we don't do that by taking away the joy and the peace that the gospel brings. We marinate in the joy and the peace that the gospel brings. And the knowledge of Christ and who he is on the basis of his life and work, who we are on the basis of that, we walk by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us in a justified, not guilty verdict reality where we're holy without blemish, free from accusation and the righteousness of God. And through Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, we're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, so that it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, not human willpower and effort, flesh putting its hand to the plow. But the ministering and the supply of the spirit is by believing what we heard, where we're strengthened by the spirit in the inner man, according to his divine power. He has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. In the Gospel of John, it says, But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. 
When it talks about that believing you might have life through his name, it's true that once we believe we have eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has everlasting life. It's the ongoing walk of faith in believing in the Son of God, the just shall live by faith, the righteous shall walk by faith. It's the ongoing walk of faith, the believing in his name by which we have life. We have life through believing in his name, and this life is the life of Christ living through us. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you might have life through his name. There's ongoing life and ministering of God's Spirit through believing in his name, what he accomplished, and who we are on the basis of his life and work. This life through believing in his name is the life of Christ himself, that it's his divine mighty power working in us, that we're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man as Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. So one of the ways to deal with your sin issues is to understand that they've already been dealt with, that Christ has removed our sins as far as the east is to the west, that there is no longer any sin issue before the eyes of God that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed, that by his stripes we are healed, that we are holy without blemish and free from accusation, according to Colossians 1.22, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ's body, by his death that we might be holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So through the death of Christ, where he was punished for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions, he now has healed us where we are holy without blemish and free from accusation in his sight. So walking by faith in this reality is walking in the spirit and God's vision, his perspective through the work of Christ and his son, what he has done and who people are on the basis of Christ and his cross. So dealing with our sin issues is having faith in the son of God, believing the truth, believing who we are on the basis of Christ and his life and work, and let Christ and his spirit work through us. He doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our cooperation. Even our faith, he doesn't need. He gave it to us. We need it, and now we need to utilize it on a daily basis, believing what we heard and understanding what Christ has done and who we are on the basis of that, walking in the spirit. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. Peace to you. Take care, and I hope your night or day is going good. God bless.